and welcome to Trinity on this, the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, how fast our seasons come around. We welcome you to Trinity Anglican Church, St. John de Brunswick, for those that are joining us a little bit later on our YouTube channel, and uh, we're pleased that you're able to be with us on this service. We thank Victor for being with us this morning for our musical ministry lead, and uh, Spencer for the work that he does continually. Our opening hymn this morning is 490, verses 1, 5, and 6. Please stand and sing as you can with your mask on.
Our first lesson is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, beginning at the first verse. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that your Lord God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in the office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number. And there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. <clears throat> the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with terrifying display of power, with signs of wonder. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given you and to your house. The word of the Lord. Epistle is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of the faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. The gradual is hymn 105, singing verses 1 and 3, 40 days and 40 nights. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, taken from the Gospel of St. Luke's fourth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. After his baptism, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when there were when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, 
command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, one does not live on bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put your Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of Christ. our faith as we repeat the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten the Father before all the world, God of God, the light of light, very God of very God, begotten of my faith, being the one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made. Who for us to make our heart salvation and be now to them, was the incarnate of the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us and our conscious father. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to Scripture, and ascended into heaven, and is still the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again in glory to judge both the quick and the dead, who he takes on the left no end. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy and Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and one for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of all our hearts be totally acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, when I put together the message for last Sunday, a couple weeks ago, I didn't think I would title this, Are We Awake? Part 2. I know you all remember last week, you've been hanging on all those words. You read about it in the newsletter, because I put it in the newsletter after the Sunday. So I know you're, we could do a Q&A here and you get 100%. But anyway, last Sunday we honored the transfiguration of our Lord, being the last Sunday after the Epiphany. And we remember how important that was, because Jesus needed to confirm two things. One, that his disciples got the message, so when he did go to Jerusalem and onto the cross, all of what he was doing 
over the last three and a half years wouldn't have been lost, but he also needed to confirm the fact that it was the right time to go to the cross, to go into Jerusalem, where he'd be arrested, falsely accused, unfairly tried, humiliated, and ultimately crucified. And I know you remember that I left you with some thoughts at the end of that about how it's mentioned in Scripture that Peter, James, and John were seen sleepy, tired. Well, sleepy is not a tiredness as much as it is not being fully awake to see what we are to see. And I talked about things like prejudice and lethargy and love at ease, those kind of things tend to keep us not fully awake. But I also mentioned there were three things that awaken us. Sorrow, love, and a sense of need. Well, I can tell you two weeks ago when I put that message together, I had no way, way to think about how those words were going to affect me on this past week. We all know the destruction that's at the hands of one person on the assault on Ukraine. And that's ticked off all three of the attributes that should awaken us. Sorrow, there cannot be anyone at all in this world that doesn't feel the sense of sorrow when they see the images that are in real time coming at us, out of Ukraine. Love, when you look at the youngest of children, and last night on the news, a mother said goodbye to an 18 month old baby. Our hearts have to pour out with an overwhelming amount of love for our fellow kind in Ukraine. And a sense of need. When you look at the Prime Minister or the President of Ukraine stand before the world day after day and plead for help. And we understand why the NATO countries can't get involved because if they do, your grandchildren could be inscripted like they were in World War II. We would be into World War III. That's the, blunt, that's the blunt of it. And not so much that is the one fellow at the head of all of this has his finger on nuclear. This past week, I talked about the new, in the newsletter about the missional outreach for Ukraine. And I cited the our Archbishop from Canterbury, Archbishop Justin Welby's comments in there. And what can we do? It's sort of like that little girl on the beach throwing one starfish back in after another when the beach is littered. What can our little voice do? What can our dollar do in such a large situation? On Thursday, morning I stopped at Galbraith Flores on Rossi Avenue and some of you may know that the new owner of Galbraith Flores is a Ukrainian lady whose all her family is still in Ukraine other than her husband and her daughter who are here. <coughs> These flowers here are the Ukrainian bouquet for everyone that she has ordered those monies are going to the Canadian Red Cross Ukrainian Relief. As of Wednesday, in the report she did for the CBC, she had 800 orders. When I went in on Thursday morning hoping to get two for the altar, she said there's 600 ahead of you. You can get yours next Thursday. She's quoted as saying, I can say 
It's not an urge to do something. It's a duty to do something. As I expressed my sincere concern for her and her family and those in Ukraine, she vis visibly was taken back. If we're not fully awake, we need to be. As I said in the message last week, not in my backyard. Well, it is in our backyard. It is people that are here among us, people that we know from different ways. On Wednesday, we entered into Lent, on Ash Wednesday, with the imposition of ashes. And it's not only the ashes and what they mean, but it's also in the manner that they're placed on our forehead. That's important. We need to remember the importance of what we go through as Christians at the Ash Wednesday service. Ashes are to remind us that we're not quite as good as we could be. We're not fully living as God would want us. Years ago, and I've mentioned this here before, but years ago, one summer, a retired senior Anglican priest was preaching over on the peninsula. And he was talking about this very thought. And he said, if today was the day we were called home, are you ready for that conversation one-on-one -on -one with God? small church he took a few minutes eyed every person up and down the road so he got you invested then he said i am not and if i am not you certainly are not either he had more years than i do i'm not going to judge whether you're ready or not but i'm not and i have to continue to work on that and we'll continue to work on that all the way to the moment God calls us home. That's called living life as a Christian. We continually seek to learn and to be more like him as we grow. The cross reminds us that we have a Savior who welcomes us. Broken people, broken hearts. He, he takes us as we are. And we're reminded that we have a God who believes in us, willing to work with us as we are. As we enter into Lent on Ash Wednesday, the work of God in Christ has been done. It's ready for us to take up the heavy lifting. This morning's scripture is one of the greatest challenges, temptation. And it's considered one of the greatest milestones in the life of Jesus. And when we think of milestones in Jesus' life, we probably would go back to, besides the birth, we go back to when he was 12 in the temple. That's when he realized God was his father in a very unique way. The next milestone would be John the Baptist when he baptized Jesus and initiated Jesus for his ministry. And then just on the heels of that, we have our scripture today where Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days. Jesus shows us through his response to the temptations of power and glory that were put before him that he'll operate in a very different manner as he accepts his life all the way to the cross. Jesus goes into the desert, it's a very lonely place. He does not eat for 40 days. What he is doing is he's contemplating on what he needs to do to win over the people. Temptations only ended for a while. If you remember the last statement I read this morning, when the devil had finished every test he departed from until an opportune time. Temptations, there were three. Stones into bread. 
Jesus say, or Satan is saying, if you want people to follow you, use your wonderful powers to give them material things. He's suggesting Jesus needs to be a magician. He needs to bribe people to follow him. The next temptation is the authority over great kingdoms. Worship me and all will be yours. And the last temptation, fall a great fall and you will not be hurt. The sheer drop would have been 450 feet into the Kedron Valley. It would have been a visual in front of a lot of people that Satan was offering Jesus. Well, the reality is we have temptations every day of life. But we have a choice at every intersection. And we will go through life serving and following Christ, and we'll suffer at times because we'll take the harder turn at that intersection all of that leads us to the cross but after that cross after the cross after our earthly journey we will be pointed to the crown amen I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Our offertory hymn is 392, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
Washington here at the Universal Church, with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word, and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also to lead all nations into the way of righteousness, and so to guide, direct their governors and rulers, that thy people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. And grant unto thy servant Elizabeth, our Queen, and to all that are put in authority under her, that they may truly and impartially administer justice and the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace to Heavenly Father to all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially to thy servant David, our bishop, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and living word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Prosper and pray thee all those who proclaim the gospel of thy kingdom among the nations, and to all thy people give thy heavenly grace. Especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all them who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Especially remembering those that are on our parish prayer list and those on our hearts this morning. Remember before thee, O Lord, all thy servants that departed this life in faith and fear. And we bless thy holy name for all who in life and death have glorified thee, beseeching thee to give us grace that, rejoicing in their fellowship, we may follow their good examples, and with them be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. And we have a prayer for Ukraine from our Archbishop Justin Baldy, Archbishop of Canterbury. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, your only mediator and advocate, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory and world without end. Amen. He that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbor, and intend to lead the new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near in faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, God Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all things, we acknowledge and confess our manifold sin and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed. By thy laws, which were in thee, against thy divine majesty, we do earnestly repent, and are heartily sorry for thee and our misdoings. Have mercy upon us, O most merciful Father, Father, by thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in the fields of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised.
Almighty, everlasting God, creator and preserver of all things. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord of hosts. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessing and glory and thanksgiving be unto thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy does give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him, and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and that institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memorial of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, who humbly beseech thee, and grant that we receive in these creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Father, O Lord of heaven and heaven, be thy humble servants with all thy holy church. Remember the precious death of thy beloved. 
Thank you.
and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.